My name is Dr. Alana Morris, and I'm an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm excited today to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Khadija Brethet. Khadija? My name is Dr. Khadija Brethet. I'm a heart failure transplant cardiologist, physician scientist, and tenured associate professor of medicine at Indiana University. Uh, my work focuses on reducing racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in heart failure. Khadija, this is exciting because we both are physician scientists that investigate and are trying to reduce the impact of healthcare disparities on patients with heart failure whom we care for every single day. So let me start with some introductory comments. We all know the burden of heart failure is on the rise. It's well described as the leading cause of hospitalization in older adults over the age of 65. However, we're also starting to see an increased number of publications that highlight the burden of premature onset heart failure. And by premature, I mean heart failure that occurs in persons under the age of 65. Importantly, within both the older and the younger age groups, the burden of heart failure unfortunately varies substantially by race and ethnicity, with Black Americans having the highest risk for early onset disease, as well as other uh, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups like Hispanic Americans, as well as American Indians. And of course, we know that the risk of hospitalizations once heart failure is manifest is also higher in those underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Um, and, you know, you and I both know that there's really an increased emphasis by healthcare systems on reducing the burden of hospitalizations among our patients with heart failure, coupled with this recent reckoning in the medical community to both acknowledge the role of structural racism and social determinants of health as drivers of adverse outcomes for patients with chronic disease. And this has really appropriately prompted a call for increased awareness of how we can address healthcare disparities as practicing clinicians. So Dr. Brethett, we're at a point as heart failure clinicians where we really have a lot to offer patients to improve morbidity and mortality, but we know that not all patients are getting this optimal care. So what do you see as the most pressing issues right now related to achieving equity in heart failure care? I'd say it's in two parts. One of which is recognizing that this is real. There's still, a, I'd say, a schism amongst healthcare professionals that um, believe this isn't important, um, believe that all they need to do is prescribe medications and that other people should worry about social determinants of health, bias, structural racism. And I think there is a greater proportion of people that recognize that that is um, far from the case, that we have to address these things if we want to achieve quality care. Mm -hmm. The second part is moving beyond just talking about the stats year after year as they continue to worsen and starting to act to actually change our behavior, change the way our systems work so that we can achieve a different outcome from what we've received in the past. I think um, those are both excellent points. And you're right, I think as clinicians, we're trained to follow guidelines, to prescribe medications, um, to try to improve outcomes. And yet we know that even adherence to those guidelines and who gets uh, certain medications differs um, across race ethnic groups. Um, for example, in heart failure, we now know that for HEFRA, for drug therapy is um, standard of care, is considered foundational care. But we know that many of those newer medications are quite costly. Um, there's been some recent analyses that have shown that the median out-of-pocket cost for four drug therapy is about $94 per month. Uh, and over the course of a year, that annual cost exceeds $2,200. Um, and this is driven primarily by the high cost of uh, angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor, or ARNI, as well as SGLT2 inhibitors. Is this an issue for patients from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups? Is this more so an issue of socioeconomic status? How should we be thinking about these issues when we're prescribing or trying to adhere to guideline direct medical therapy amongst our patients with heart failure? Cost is a major issue. If we're not addressing this with patients, we can't expect that they're going to actually get these treatments that save their lives. That's incredibly naive. We have to start having these conversations with shared decision-making where we're willing to discuss costs and how these different therapies might impact them. And some of this is going to clearly go beyond what the individual clinician can do. This is a system and policy level issue. I think this is going to require people being advocates, political advocates, speaking to our politicians, um, 
writing letters, um, speaking up to insurance companies to let them know that the way things currently are going is insufficient, it's inappropriate and leads to inadequate care. We have to do a better job of identifying how we can get these wonderful therapies that work well for patients to the patients that need them most. I'm not saying that everybody has to have the same um, fee system, but for those that can't afford it or that it's more difficult, we need to have a different system in place. Because the current one, as you know, is mostly helpful for people with um, private types of insurance with the patient assistance plans. They're not based for people that have a more difficult time paying for these things. That's exactly right. For our Medicare patients, especially, there are oftentimes their uh, out-of-pocket cost for these medications goes up astronomically. You and I probably see that every day in clinic um, when we listen to our patients describe their difficulties with financial considerations. But even beyond drugs, we've seen some really interesting data with device-based therapies, transcatheter-based therapies, where unfortunately, geographic location and neighborhood also perhaps seem to be drivers of the dramatic disparities that we see in terms of who's getting those therapies. Um, we know, for example, when you look at some of the TAVR data, um, that patients of color, Black patients in particular, are much less likely to get TAVR. Um, and there's been some recent analyses that have shown that neighborhood um, may be one of the drivers. And I think, you know, intuitively, we realize that our large structural programs that offer these types of interventions tend to really only be located in large academic or large wealthy hospitals and are very rarely located in safety net hospitals or smaller community centers where uh, black and brown patients are more likely to receive their care. How do we address issues such as these? We need to go back to the, the guidelines. Like there's actually in the guidelines this year is class one for addressing care for vulnerable populations where we have to look at our system. We have to address what are we doing from a multidisciplinary standpoint to allocate therapies equitably to our patients. We have to address social determinants of health. We have to address bias and we have to establish metrics that we measure as an individual as well as a system. We've seen this at even our amazing, um, highly rated academic centers where the care is still inequitable. We've, I've done national studies showing that you're less likely to get care by a cardiologist if you're black race versus white. And this is over, over hundreds of thousands of people and hundreds of hospitals representing well over 20% of the US. And uh, another group showed that within one of the top institutions in the country that they see these same findings where the black patients go to one service and the white patients go to the cardiology service. So it's a very, I think, deeply ingrained issue that we have to recognize that, yeah, yes, yeah, structural racism exists. And this is what we're going to try to do to address that. Um, when we talk about structural racism, we also have to think about what our responsibility is as clinicians caring for patients. I think all of us, you know, work hard or under a lot of stress, particularly as we've been trying to implement healthcare during this ongoing pandemic. Um, and so it's hard, I think, for many of us to think that perhaps we're caring for patients from certain groups differently, and there may be a role of bias. What has your work taught us about how clinicians might be aware of their own biases when they're caring for patients, but more importantly, how can we overcome those biases so that we can be delivering equitable care across different demographic groups? I think that the majority of people think they're doing the right thing, or they think that, yes, it's present, but not in my care, not in our system, when in fact it actually is. And um, you helped be a part of this national study we did um, looking at how clinicians, how nurses, how social workers make decisions about who should get advanced therapies, randomizing them to a black man or a white man with identical clinicals and social histories. And unbeknownst to them that the point was to figure out how does race impact our decision making. And we use think aloud, step-by-step -step interview and identify that yes, race actually impacts how people make decisions and that Black people aren't given the benefit of the doubt. Black people are judged more harshly. Black people die. And this is from people that I don't think would 
think in their heart that they could be a part of that system, but they are. And we have to start to use some of the structured uh, methods to address them, like evidence-based bias reduction training, evidence-based anti-racism reduction, using objective measures that um, quantify things like adherence and social support so that we can start to tease away and remove the the levels of bias and structural racism that impact these life changing decisions for our patients. And it's hard work and it's um, something I'm incredibly passionate about and um, engaging in a, a, a national um, pragmatic um, randomized controlled trial to try to address this. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely hard work. And I think we're, we need more studies like this uh, that are, use implementation science using different strategies to try to address these known disparities so we can actually change them instead of talking about the stats year after year. And I think, you know, we've talked about a couple of the, I think the key stakeholders, including um, clinicians, uh, as well as healthcare systems that really have to embrace anti-racism and equity and health equity as core values. Um, across the current political landscape, what can we do as societies? How should we be engaging our policymakers, perhaps, to uh, improve health equity? Because again, this is you know, an issue that crosses many different levels within healthcare and is certainly goes beyond the patient clinician relationship. I think there are multiple ways to, to get involved. Um, just at an individual level is looking at how you provide care and uh, talking to the patient, finding out what's troubling them, what are their barriers, and identify resources within your center to help address the barriers per person, make it individualized. Um, from a system level within the healthcare system to meet with the leaders and those that are in charge of the resources to identify how can you create resources for patients that need them. Because every hospital system has some wiggle room for how they allocate resources and to show how it's cost saving as well as quality um, level improving that this is the right thing to do for our patient population. Um, and I think from a more of like community level um, as well as policy level, we have to start engaging with stakeholders, those that um, are community leaders that care about this and to, to meet and decide how can we collectively make changes within our healthcare system, within our city, within our state to improve the care of our patients. And I think the more that we build momentum, having these conversations, um, letter writing campaigns to our policymakers and being proactive with our different um, cardiovascular associations like the ACC, AHA, ABC, that we'll be able to have a collective voice to demonstrate the need for action, the need for change. And I think that's what policymakers listen to, the voice of their constituents. Well, thank you, Dr. Brett, that your wisdom in this space has been incredibly valuable. I'm excited to see um, what's up next in terms of your work, and I'm excited for you to continue to teach us how we can improve health equity and how we can do this better as both clinicians, scientists, and healthcare systems. Well, thank you so much.